the next talk. Hey guys, all right, so I'm between you and Lynch, so I'll try to be fast. Um, I'll be talking about MLlib today, it's Spark's machine learning library. And my background's in large scale machine learning, so you know, with that lens in mind, I'd like to first motivate why we embarked on MLlib in the first place a few years ago, especially given that there are you know, several other uh, open, or many open source libraries and some not that do machine learning and do it quite well. So when we were thinking about large scale machine learning, there were a few criteria that we wanted to to achieve, uh, the first being, of course, scalability and performance. We wanted a library that worked on large-scale data that took advantage of uh, distributed cluster environments. Beyond that, we wanted a library that worked well, or that, that afforded a simple development environment, both to run algorithms, deploy them, and also to you know, adapt given algorithms or write new algorithms within the library. And finally, we wanted a library that integrated well with other data processing components. Of course, machine learning is very important, but there's other things you need to do to get a pipeline running. So with these three criteria in mind, when we started looking around, we didn't really see anything that naturally fit the bill, so we embarked on MLlib. And I would argue that MLlib satisfies all three of these constraints. Uh, it's scalable and fast. Being part of Spark, it, it has a nice development environment. And again, as you probably guys, you've heard several times by now, the fact that it's part of this nice ecosystem means that you can do many different things along with machine learning, such as you know, Spark SQL, streaming, graphics, and so on. All right, so that's a very high level overview, but for the remainder of the talk, I'd first like to you know, dive into a little bit more about what is MLlib, what, what you can do there, uh, and then I'll go into a few examples of how you can actually use it, and finally, I'll talk about a roadmap of what we expect to see in the next release and beyond. All right, so MLlib is an offshoot of MLbase. Uh, MLbase is an open source project coming from the AMP lab at UC Berkeley. The idea of MLbase is to uh, simplify the development and deployment of large-scale machine learning pipelines. Uh, it's a project that's built upon Spark, and the two goals are really higher-order higher machine learning problems. The first is namely coming up with an experimental API that simplifies the development of machine learning. So instead of a machine learning developer having to implement things in terms of just bare-bones MapReduce, for instance, we want to expose higher-level primitives, tables, uh, matrices and you know, underlying convex optimization primitives to make development easier. On top of that, we wanted optimizers to auto-tune machine learning pipelines. So there's a lot of different algorithms for classification, regression, different other types of machine learning problems. There's also various feature extractors that you can use to process your data along the way. And each of these different feature extractors and algorithms have a lot of different parameters, hyperparameters that you need to tune. So the idea of the, this top level is to try to put these all together, search over this large space, and get a reasonable result. So these are the two high-level goals of MLbase, but in order to actually build them, we first needed a core within uh, Spark that actually performed machine learning so that we could build on top of it. So MLlib naturally you know, came out as a, as a product of our higher-level goals in MLbase. Uh, and you know, I get asked this question a lot about what the difference is between MLlib and MLi in particular, and so I just want to be very clear that it's, you know, MLlib is a production-quality machine learning library shipped as part of Spark, whereas MLi, as well as MLopt, are experimental test beds. So the idea there is that we're, we're looking at new, interesting research, hopefully interesting research questions, and successful ideas that we, we study in ML, MLopt and MLI will percolate into MLlib when, once they're more mature. And we've already started to see that, and I'll point that out a little bit more throughout this talk. Uh, and also, I should note that Evan Sparks gave a nice talk uh, yesterday at the Spark Summit about MLbase. So you should watch that video online once it becomes available if you're interested in learning more about MLbase. Okay. So as I mentioned, uh, MLlib came out of, was an offshoot, the, the first release was an offshoot of the MLbase project, developed predominantly by the AMP Lab with a you know, small number of contributors, shipped last fall uh, as part of the Spark 0.8 release, but it's been really incredible to see the, ra the rapid development of it just in the last nine months. So fast forward nine months, we have you know, more, than, uh, more than quadruple the number of contributors. The latest release was included in you know, Spark version 1.0 with a lot, lot more of additional functionality. So for instance, just, if you just think about algorithms, uh, in the first version, we had you know, the algorithms listed on the slide. I'm not gonna list each one of them, but basically we had common algorithms for classification, regression, collaborative filtering, clustering, as well as uh, one particular underlying optimization primitive that was powering a lot of the classification and regression algorithms. Fast forward to version 1.0, we've added additional functionality for these five existing classes of algorithms. We've also added a new class of algorithms related to dimensionality reduction. Uh, and I'd like to point out one of them in particular, uh, which are decision trees. Uh, and you know, when we, when we started talking about MLlib, even last fall, the, the thing that we kept getting asked about was decision trees and ensembles of decision trees. 
These are very popular in practice. They're interpretable. They support categorical variables and missing data. And you know, as, as you guys probably know, uh, ensembles of these, random forests or boosting, are top performers in practice. They're also very robust and kind of easy to use. So people really wanted these. Uh, we don't yet have ensembles in MLib, but we have the decision trees themselves there. They scale very nicely. They work for classification and regression. And adding ensembles on top of them is kind of a thin wrapper given these decision trees. Uh, and so we, we also have to come up with some pretty neat optimization tricks to get these things to scale nicely in Spark. Uh, Manish Ande gave a talk on Monday describing this in more detail. So I encourage you guys to watch his talk if you're interested. OK. So that's just in terms of algorithms, how we've, you know, what, what was there, what is there now. But there's other new developments in, in the most recent release of MLib. Uh, first, related to documentation. So we have a new, you know, an up, updated user guide. We have some code examples and templates that help you navigate through uh, MLlib. We also, as with the rest of Spark, we have API stability at this point. And finally, we've, you know, borrowed some ideas, as I mentioned, from MLbase MLI already. One is uh, sparse data support. The second is making matrices first-class objects in, in MLlib. So I'd like to talk about a few of these in a little bit more detail. So the first is the uh, improved user guide. And you know, basically, just the, the user guide is much more in-depth, more, more, more explanations, more examples. It's organized much better. We have code snippets embedded in the user guide to sort of give you uh, additional information about how, what's going on with MLlib and how to use it. We've also uh, included code examples which you know, illustrate how you can actually use this on real-ish world data. Uh, and it's also, you know, we've found that they've been useful as templates for standalone applications. So here's an example of uh, a code example for collaborative filtering for the ALS algorithm included in MLlib. Uh, and basically, you can, working with a, a, a common open source or publicly available data set, you can run MLlib and tr you can run MLlib or the collaborative filtering algorithm in MLlib and train a, a, a recommendation system. And I'll get back to this a little bit more later because for your exercises today, uh, the MLlib component of it, you'll actually be doing something quite similar to this. All right, so we have examples not just for, uh, ML, not just for uh, collaborative filtering, but also for various classification algorithms, clustering, regression, and, and so on. All right, uh, another really, really important aspect of the new release of MLlib is, is the ability to exploit sparsity. So data is, you know, in machine learning, sparse features are super common. I, I'm, I just listed here four examples of it, but I, you could list another, another 40. Uh, so text processing is very common. You represent text with bags of words or, or n-grams. In collaborative filtering, the, under, the main object here is a sparse ratings matrix. Various graphs or various matrices associated with graphs, including an adjacency matrix, are you know, typically sparse. In genomics, the objects that you want to uh, typically analyze, again, are sparse. So, uh-oh, let's push the wrong button, sorry. Okay, yeah, so MLlib uh, is now supporting sparse storage and communication for certain classes of algorithms right now, so for classification, k-means, and uh, summary statistics. And we've seen that this, not surprisingly, can have a big impact on performance. So here's one example uh, of exploiting sparsity in the context of clustering with a k-means algorithm. And basically, we have this training set. It's uh, Twitter, Twitter tweets, 12 million examples, 500 features. Because it's text, it's, surprisingly, or it's unsurprisingly sparse. And basically what we see is a 7x, uh, 7x savings in storage, or 40 gigabyte savings in storage, and a 4x speed up in computation by taking account of uh, sparsity. And I would argue here, actually, that this is actually not very sparse for a sparse data set. So typically, you often see data sets that are 1% sparse or less. So you, know, you could hopefully get even better results. Uh, and I would point you to Sean Rhee's uh, talk on the first day of the Spark Summit, where he, he spoke in more detail about uh, adding sparsity to MLlib, if you'd like to learn more about it. Okay, so that's kind of a, a rough overview of, of where we are today with MLlib. I'd next like to talk about, uh, just to show you some examples of how you can actually use it. And these examples are going to be focused on k-means and collaborative filtering. So before showing the examples, I'm going to give a very, very quick tutorial on how each of these algorithms work, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So the first is k-means. Uh, and you know, I hope many of you probably know this already, but the idea of k-means, it's a clustering algorithm where you want to partition your points into k-clusters. So here's a toy example. You have 11 points that are roughly, as you can see visually, they're you know, two-dimensional points. You can see that they're roughly are three clusters. So let's pick k equals three. And then the idea of k-means is very simple. You just alternate between two different steps. The first step is to compute cluster centers. 
And here, one, one way, the naive way to pick cl cluster cent uh, centers when you start is to just randomly choose them. So we're going to randomly choose three cluster centers. Then the next step is to assign cluster membership given cluster centers. So we have these three cluster centers, and basically for each, each point, we want to see which cluster center it's closest to and assign it to that cluster center. All right, so we do that. And now we want to go back to computing cluster centers again. So now we have these points that are colored. We know e each cluster is represented by the subset of points that are within it. And basically, we can recompute a cluster center just by taking the average of all the points within the cluster. So now we have new cluster centers. And again, we repeat by assigning cluster membership. And you can keep doing this until you, you, know, you, run, out, you, you run it for a max number of iterations or until it converges to some, you know, to some minimum. All right, so that's how k-means works. It's a commonly used algorithm in practice for exploring your data or as a pre-processing step, for instance, for some sort of hier hierarchical modeling. You might want to learn a different classifier, for instance, for different clusters of your data. And you know, how can we actually do k-means in, in MLM? Well, I mean, these code snippets are really just meant to illustrate that it's pretty easy to do this. So in this particular example, we're loading a text file that's space separated. So the first two lines, we're just processing this text file. We then train a model with k-means by feeding it that data along with two parameters, the, number, the, the value k and the number of iterations we want to run. And then the bottom few lines, we're simply using this model to compute the error on the training data. So that's an example in Scala. You can do something very similar here in Python. Uh, and the, the one thing I would like to point out here is that, so here when, when training the k-means model, we're explicitly uh, specifying the way we want to initialize the cluster centers. And you know, I kind of glossed over that when going through the example, but random or night, randomly picking the cluster centers to start isn't always a good idea. Your results can vary a fair bit. Uh, there has been some theoretical results in the last five, 10 years showing that by being a little bit more careful about how you initialize, you can do much better. The default way in MLlib to pick cluster centers is exactly using uh, this, this more sophisticated uh, way of initialization. And here we're explicitly, we're explicitly telling the algorithm to initialize it this way. And it's called k-means plus plus, or there's a parallel implementations of it, which is called k-means parallel, which is what you're seeing here. All right, so here's another example of using k-means. Here we're using it in the first by doing dimensionality reduction and then running k-means. I didn't really, I haven't talked about dimensionality reduction, but on a very high level, the idea is that imagine you have many observations and they're each represented by lots of features. Uh, having lots of features, having a high dimension can be costly when you want to compute distances or just operate on this, on this data. It also can lead you to suffer from what's called the, the curse of dimensionality, where in very high dimensional spaces, Euclidean distances are sort of not as meaningful as you would like. So both for computational reasons and potentially for statistical reasons, it can be a good thing to do dimensionality reduction before running k-means. So what we're showing here is an example of loading an RDD from some you know, unspecified source uh, storing it as a row matrix in MLlib, computing, running PCA on it to compute its top 20 principal components, and then projecting your input data onto these uh, top 20 principal components to get a low dimensional representation of your data. And now instead of running k-means on your original data, you're just running k-means on this low dimensional uh, representation of your data for, again, for computational and possibly statistical reasons. All right, uh, so here's yet another example, and you know, this is, sure. So you, you can use that model and feed it to new points to give you predictions. That's right. yeah. partitioning and everything is I mean models are typically I mean if, if K is very big they can so yeah. for for certain sorts of models you have to worry about that, but in this case, typically for K means your model's not gonna be that big, it's just not not an issue. Um, okay, so here's an example uh, with streaming. And so Michael, when talking about uh, Spark SQL, showed an example of, of Spark SQL with MLib. TD showed also an example of streaming and uh, Spark SQL. And it, you know, I would argue that it's, it's a really cool thing in MLlib that we have the opportunity to combine it with other really important components in a you know, data processing pipeline. Here's an example that's very much similar to uh, Ali's demo from the first day. And it's kind of just a, a toy example. But the idea is that imagine you want to process tweets in a streaming fashion, and you want to filter them based on some criteria. Imagine that criteria is that you only want to keep, you know, as in the, the uh, demo, tweets related to soccer and not those related to other sports. So you could do that by first training a model offline with some other data, 
uh, and possibly doing the model you could train could possibly be a clustering model where you cluster your data, find the cluster associated with you know, soccer, and then as you're processing tweets, you can run that model on each tweet, see if it's in the appropriate cluster, and only display it if that's the case. So this is sort of a toy example, but. Yeah, so that's, that's a different thing, and that, you know, TD mentioned we want a, one extension of MLlib, which I think is really important, is adding online training of algorithms, or even if you do an offline training of an algorithm, how do you do, you know, incremental updates? We don't have that yet. There's, you know, it's an interesting research question. It's interesting in practice, but that's, that's not covered here. It's a good question. Um, so, again, I would encourage you there to, to look at Aaron Davidson's talk from the Hadoop Summit last month, or Ali's uh, demo from a few days ago to, to see further examples related to this. Okay, so that's enough about k-means. I'll, I'll next talk about collaborative filtering. And again, this is what you guys will be doing in your exercises today. So just to remind everyone, collaborative filtering is you know, typically motivated by this movie recommendation example. The idea is that you have movies and you have users. Some users have rated some movies, and what you want to do is predict the rate the missing rating. So recover a matrix from a subset of its entries. Uh, at least in the research community, the Netflix Prize seven to 10 years ago really got people really excited about this, but of course, lots of organizations at this point are very excited about this. Uh, just mathematically, it, you know, without making additional assumptions, this is just a, an ill-posed problem. Uh, if, you know, you have, if every entry of your matrix is completely independent, there's no way you can hope to learn from what you've seen. So you have to do something to, to reduce the degrees of freedom. Uh, and you do that by making, or you can do that, and people often do this by making a so-called low-rank assumption. So the idea is that you assume that there's a small number of preferences that determine user preference and that describe movies, and doing so, you can drastically reduce the degrees of freedom in your model. So when you make this low-rank assumption, you have a linear set of degrees of freedom. You can actually hope to learn given a subset of the data. Also, it allows you to have a model that's a lot smaller. So that's going back to one of the earlier questions today. Um, all right, so you make this low-rank assumption. There's many ways to now try to learn this model. What we currently have in, uh, in MLlib is uh, the, the alternating least squares algorithm, and this is a commonly used algorithm in practice, and it scales pretty nicely. And, and, and its flavor is kind of similar to k-means, as I talked about before, in that you alternate between two different steps. So I'll describe really quickly how it works. What I'm showing in this picture here on the left is this ratings matrix. This is the matrix where you want to impute the missing entries. I'm denoting by the blue squares here the entries or the ratings that you have seen. So those are the observed entries. And the right-hand side are the, the user and the movie factors. So now if we look at the first row of this uh, ratings matrix, we see the ratings that the first user has uh, actually you know, given to us. And we can describe the training error of this first user as the difference between each of these ratings and what a model would predict for it. So that's, that's kind of what this pictorial equation in the middle of the screen is showing you. There's two terms. Each term is a difference between a rating and the corresponding prediction that a model would give you. That's just a dot product between two vectors, the user vector and the associated, uh, uh, the, the user features and the associated movie features. And the idea of ALS is basically that we want to alternate between updating the user and movie factors. So going back to this training error, there are two unknowns here. So the, the blue box, the ratings are fixed, they're given to us, but we want to learn, learn both the, um, the green and the orange uh, feature vectors, but we don't want to learn them both at the same time. Instead, we fix one and try to learn the other. So if we want to update the first user, for instance, we would fix the green uh, feature vectors and just try to find the best orange feature vector to minimize the training error. This can, be, this can be reduced to a standard linear regression problem. Moreover, you can do this in parallel for all users at the same time. You have to be a little bit careful about how you, uh, how you minimize communication for large-scale problems, but if, if you do this in a reasonable way, you can do these all in parallel. Once you're done with all the users, you can then go back and do the same thing for all the movies. And again, keep doing this in an iterative fashion until you converge to you know, a stable answer or until you've run for a certain number of iterations. All right, so that's ALS. Uh, and you know, this is an example of how you actually would run ALS in, in MLlib. And again, it's, you know, it's pretty simple. You're first loading some data and parsing it. You want to create a ratings RDD, which stores tuples of user, item, and ratings. Uh, you then train an ALS model by feeding it into this, this ratings uh, RDD and also hyperparameters of the ALS algorithm, the rank, the regularizer, and the number of iterations you want to run. And finally, you can use the, the learned model to make predictions on new data, or in this case, on the, the training data in the first place. All right, so that's a, that's a 
simple example. And what you guys will be doing in your exercise today is extending that. So basically, you'll be working with this movie lens data set. There's two versions of this data set, a smaller and a bigger one, with you know, a million or 10 million ratings. Uh, what you're get, then going to do is you're going to be asked to rate some examples yourself of the movies that are included in this data set. Given this training data, or given this, this labeled data, you're going to split it into training and validation data. You're then going to fit a model using the training data, either in Python or in Scala. You're then going to you're going to see how well it performs by seeing how well it performs on the validation data, to com so computing some sort of validation error, and then try to improve that model by tuning different parameters to see how high you can get the uh, validation error. And finally, once you get a model with with sufficiently good parameters, you're going to get recommended. You're going to run that model on on to see what you know what it recommends to you. The the movies in this in this data set are kind of old, so don't be too excited about the ratings. But I think it's a pretty cool example of of how you can do this pretty quickly in ML11 Spark. Okay, so that's that's some examples. I'd next like to briefly talk about conclude by talking about the roadmap for ML11 moving forward. Uh, so as you may have heard by now, uh, Spark is on a three-month release cycle. Uh, so the next release, the cutoff for features, is the end of July. And so you know, what do we have planned for this next release? Well, the first is that we want to further standardize interfaces within MLlib. This is, again, borrowing from ideas in MLI. And in particular, one, one thing we want to work on is for, for different class, there, there, there's many different underlying optimization primitives that you can use to train a particular model. So there's different ways to learn an SVM classifier, or logistic regression, or, or, or so on. And we want to have different ways, we, we want to have abstractions that are separating the underlying optimization primitive versus the, the model that we're trying to learn. And you know, this is an idea from, from MLI. Second, we're, we're hoping to get parallel model training into uh, MLlib. It might not happen for this release. If not, it'll happen in the next release. Uh, but the idea here is that you often have to train multiple models at the same time uh, because you want to you know, learn optimal hyperparameters for them. And as Evan talked about in his talk yesterday, you can often do this. Uh, if, if you train things in parallel, you can kind of often do that for free, given that it takes longer to read from memory than it does to do uh, computations. Next, we're adding a statistical toolbox for the descriptive, descriptive statistics, sampling, and hypothesis testing. Uh, we're also adding additional learning algorithms and additional optimization algorithms. Uh, and then beyond version 1.1, 1 .1, 1 .1, what do we expect? Well, I, you know, it's, it's hard to know exactly. It's, it's kind of depending on the community a fair bit. Uh, but one thing I think it's safe to say is that we're hoping to have scalable implementations of standard machine learning algorithms and optimization primitives. I think we've already seen rapid growth in the last nine months, and I think you know, we're well along the way of covering many of the important algorithms that people care about for machine learning. Uh, so second, you know, we want to continually improve the documentation and have consistent APIs, and we've already started doing that. Uh, and you know, furthermore, we want to support machine learning pipeline development. So part of this is related to the, the ML base project in terms of auto-tuning, but we also want to add feature ex common feature extractors for typical sorts of problems related to images or text, for instance. We also want to add additional code examples and templates that people can use, hopefully, to you know, maybe build their own applications. Uh, but of course, you know, these are just ideas. Feedback and contributions are encouraged, and you know, the, the interests of the community are really is what's going to guide future uh, functionality into MLib. So please contribute and discuss if you're interested in, in adding things. And so with that, I will conclude, let you eat lunch. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about MLlib, you can check out the, the user guide. And I'd like to thank all the, the many con contributors to MLlib. And that's it. Thanks a lot. Um, so, we're, it's a stretch goal to have ensembles of decision trees in 1.1, but it kind of depends. So hopefully 1.1, but I would not want to commit to that. But I would say that random forest boosting, random forest and boosting are two of the things we hear most about that people want. So it is very high on our priority list. We just want to make sure it's working well and thoroughly tested before, before it's added. All right, great. Well, I'll be here all day, so happy to answer more questions throughout the day. Thanks again.